Hello, you're watching the business interview here on France 24. I'm Tom Burgess Watson, and my guest today is a rare hybrid of journalist, entrepreneur, style guru, and he's apparently giving fashion tips to royalty. He's also been named by Le Figaro Madame as one of the most elegant men on earth. He is the founder of Wallpaper and Monocle magazines, and he's the author of the Financial Times weekly Fast Lame column. And reading that, we can only assume he's as frequent a flyer as George Clooney's character in the film Up in the Air. Tyler Brule, editor-in-chief and chairman of Monocle, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now, Monocle described itself as witty, hard-hitting and offbeat. You've, had, you've got more than 100 editions now to your name and you've just launched a radio channel, a 24-hour mm. radio channel. Um, but it's not audio. It's not video, sorry. It's mm. audio. Aren't you about 75 years late to the game? No, I think we're 75 years ahead of the game. Um, and we just, uh, we also, we have 50 issues so far. But I guess I've probably done 100 monthly magazines if you if you put uh, uh, Wallpaper and uh, and Monocle together. But uh, no, we, we struck upon a very interesting opportunity that I think that there are a number of, certainly listeners, who I think want a different type of global narrative daily. So I think we've, we, we struck upon certainly scope for an audience, but also uh, revenue as well, that we, we established that there are a lot of major international brands that want to be in a, in a premium audio space, but they can't go there because whether it's NPR or Radio France or it's the BBC, there's no advertising. Uh, and so what's been very interesting for us is that uh, we've launched something which is, you know, digitally based. It's an internet-based radio network, um, but it has, you know, very strong advertising sponsorship behind it. Uh, so and there's different segments are sponsored by different uh, correct. companies. Correct. So there's a CS. Yeah, so you have a, a series of, of live daily programs plus a variety of, of feature programs, you know, like you would find in, in any sort of traditional public service uh, broadcast or, or TV station for that man, uh, matter. Um, and yeah, and then those have uh, various sponsors and advertising support around them. So monocle readers have to get the hard copy yes. or listen to your radio. You're not going down the iPad route. Why is that? We are not. Uh, there is a, an app which is available for, for Monocle 24, uh, and, and it, it's configured. I mean, it's, it's primarily been designed for the iPhone, and it will be in other formats later on. I don't or have not found a, a revenue model uh, that, that works uh, of taking traditional print and putting it onto an iPad. And I've spoken to or had a number of publishers come to me saying, why aren't you doing it? Uh, I wish we would have spoken to you or your consultants. We don't have consultants. It was just a hunch um, that it wouldn't work. And I think if you speak to most people today, unless someone is a pornography king, uh, they're not making money uh, on their iPad versions. But they don't have to pay the cost of printing this pretty weighty magazine, mm. uh, and, and then shipping it to subscribers. That's, yeah, there's, but there's even huge, so. There, there's huge fuel costs and all of those associated. But I think if you look at, you know, there's a number of things. There's, you have to look at, of course, the reader first. And I don't think everyone today wants to consume their media only in a digital environment. And so there's a point of differentiation. Hopefully you can see, uh, or at least the camera can see it from the far side of the room, that the magazine, there is a heft and there's a weight. And what we've tried to bring back is an, an element of collectability. I think that we've seen over the last decade Decade, decade and a half that the quality of magazines has just decreased. Uh, and so you've seen a lot of publishers saying, well, I have to spend a bit of money digitally. I have to spend money on my print and ink as well. What's going to give? And so they've, they've been splitting their strategy and you know, many of them have not a great website and also they don't have a great magazine anymore. And so that's been, you know, what we've done is say, let's have something which is tangible and, you know, and people want to, to collect it. And no surprise, of course, readers like it and advertisers like it too. Who, who is a monocle reader? Who, who picks this magazine up at 12 euros a go on a mm. newsstand here in mainland Europe or five pounds in, in Great Britain? Uh, who, who are you writing for? Well, hopefully you're one of them. Uh, no, but I, you know, we're, we're targeting, uh, certainly, um, you know, we, we do one edition for the world. So uh, it doesn't matter whether you are, are in Sapporo uh, or you're in Toulouse, you get the, the exact same edition. And I think that speaks to the audience that we're talking to. And that is someone who is looking for opportunities around the world. Uh, and that can be a personal consumer opportunity, or it could be an acquisition for your business. Uh, it could be, you know, and it could be anything in between. Um, l largely male audience. 70%, uh, I would say, uh, well-traveled, uh, certainly someone who's leading uh, very much a, a trans-border lifestyle. And we really see that when we meet our readers, they are out there you know, and, and actively, actively traveling. Uh, and, you know, and beyond that, uh, it's probably a little, roughly half of our readership is Europe, and then a quarter Asia, quarter, quarter the Americas. And are you niche enough to be insulated from what's currently going on in the world at the time of austerity that we live in? 
I, I wouldn't say what's currently going on. We, you know, we, don't, we certainly don't know where things are going. I can say before I jumped on the, uh, the train to Paris that uh, we just closed our biggest issue ever in terms of pages and ad revenue. So that's a good sign. But you know, we launched in, in 2007. Uh, and of course, we saw what happened a couple of months after we launched. That the markets, uh, you know, arrived in that not particularly pretty place that <laughs> that they were, and and we, uh, you know, we, you know, certainly as a launch, um, we managed to go through that and just continue to grow. So I think just speaking from where we were last time, um, insulated from it, you know, one never knows. But uh, I, you know, it's not just us. I think that there are certain international titles many of them resting in London, uh, which, uh, you know, which I think have managed to do well. And, and part of it is because they can rely on the strength of Brazil at one time, or they can rely on what's happening on Southeast Asia, and not just concern themselves on what is the health of the British market or how well is Germany doing at the moment. One of the things you do each year, and you've been doing it since uh, the magazine started back in 2007, are these most livable city indexes. Um, at the moment, you've got Helsinki in number one, Zurich in number two, Copenhagen in three, but Paris is in 12th mm. place. I think it was in seventh place the previous year. Where's Paris falling short of uh, your standards? Well, first I will say that, uh, in the interest of diplomacy, that everyone should be thrilled who makes the list. Uh, they're, all, they're all doing a good job. Uh, why, why did Paris drop? Uh, I think for, for a variety of reasons. We do change the metrics um, every year. Uh, and, and so what we did when we, when we reshuffled the deck this year is that we looked at uh, ease of opening business. Uh, we, we, is this a city that you want to be in as, as a young entrepreneur? Uh, so how, uh, how easy or how obstructive is the climate? Um, and of course, one has to look at labor issues in this country, et cetera, perhaps not a place you would run to if you were sitting in even Helsinki and you want to look at a business. So that was, that was one, I'd say, the, the key things that, that worked against uh, the city. And whether you felt that it was also a city, and part of this is, you know, is, is through interviews, some of it is also, um, yeah, I would say anecdotal as well. You know, do you feel this is a city which is engaged with the future? Uh, and is this, is this a land of opportunity? And, and that worked against Paris. And for Europeans who are looking at what's going on around them, especially right now, more now than perhaps at any time since the Second World War, mm -hmm. we're thinking perhaps it's time to, to leave Europe. Perhaps mm -hmm. it's time to go somewhere else. Or maybe somewhere else in Europe. <laughs> yeah. Or somewhere else in Europe. Yeah. But where would you have as your suggested mm -hmm. place to someone that came to you and says, I think it's time for me to go. Where do I go? Well, I would suggest two places. Uh, I would either look at Brazil right now. That's that's an obvious. I think Brazil is is a very interesting market to look at. Um, I think the other, uh, you know, the other one I would look at is I think Japan is really interesting. Uh, Japan, of course, is not so open arms when it comes to letting in foreigners. Uh, but I think that there are a lot of opportunities in Japan uh, at the you moment. You don't feel that Japan's sort of had its day. It's playing second or third it, fiddle to no, China. No, and I think I think that's part of it. I think that that's, mm -hmm. that's that provides opportunity. And it's the the your passion for Japan. Mm -hmm is extremely evident mm. on pretty much every edition every page, of, yeah. of, of, of Monaco. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's a really, it's a very interesting market and we can get as excited as we want about uh, China, but the, the, very, the fascinating thing about Japan is that, you know, certainly for this country as well, the power that, you know, that exists as a luxury goods market is, is quite extraordinary. And yet you, you live in London, why is that? Mm. If you're going to be in the business of doing English language media, it's the place you still need to be. I think international English, English language media. Well, you know, New York might say otherwise, but. Okay, and you haven't yet been to mainland China, if I I've not. done my homework correctly. Yeah. Is, Hong planning, Kong many times, but not Are you planning tonight. to fix that? Maybe, if I get the right offer, if, the, if there's business there. I mean, you know, what of course drives us is, is readership, and we're banned in many parts of China, problem. Um, and you there, have a retail shop in, in Beijing. We do, and we can't sell our magazine there. How extraordinary is that? <laughs> You can look at it, but you can't buy it. Are you, are you trying to change that? Yeah, we are. Um, a recent column you wrote mm. on the Financial Times lamented the evaporation of charm, to quote you there, in, in service industry, yeah. particularly in the airline industry. You come across as slightly old-fashioned. Mm. You're harking back to the day of radio and yeah. charm in, 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 in the airline industry. Is, is that something perhaps uh, that's fair to say of you, that you have slightly old-fashioned ideas? A little bit. I think that we, you know, we've been down this sort of designer route for so long uh, that everything needs to be modernized. Everyone needs a you know, battalion of consultants deployed against it, and it needs to be rethought. And, and sometimes I think we forget about the importance of of patina and tradition uh, and and experience and the experience on the part of staff that it's not just about bringing the most handsome and youngest people in uh, you know or the prettiest girl in the room uh, but also someone who who understands and and has a, a legacy and a history of, of working with um, their customers 
And you're going to keep flying around the world forevermore? Have you, have you not reached the stage? Until there's, you... more, until there's more trains. Um, but yeah, I guess you, that's the moment. You fly so much, you must mm. get exhausted by yeah. constantly being in an aeroplane. Not, not so bad. I can do it my own way. And what's your trick good. for getting over the jet lag? Our Just viewers... sleeping. Sleeping and sleeping. Yep. And more sleep. Um, two glasses of red wine. Sleep. That's it. No drugs. Okay, yeah. for someone watching who's a business traveler, your secret for getting over a painful long-haul flight? A run when I land. Before yeah. or after? No, after. after. Yeah, as soon as okay. I land, go, go for a run. Okay. Yeah. And finally, I want to ask mm. you, I'm going to spring a, a yeah. surprise on you. A bit of karaoke is yes. apparently something you enjoy doing. Yeah. A lot of people watching will have been in that nightmare scenario mm. where the they microphone the microphone in front of them yeah. arrives in their hand. They're told to stand up and yeah. sing in Japan in particular. Mm. What song have you got nailed? Uh, I would say that I've got Superstar by the Carpenters nailed. Uh, and yeah, and I can do not a bad version of Sukiyaki in Japanese as long as I can read it um, in Romanji on the screen. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll have to... Uh, Take some pages out of your book and make sure we're adequately prepared next time we go to Japan. Thank you very much indeed, Tyler Brule, Editor-in-Chief and Chairman of Monocle. And thank you to you for watching. Do stay tuned. More news coming up shortly here on France 24.